Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another Astronomy Fundamentals program coming from the Naperville Astronomical Association here in Northern Illinois. I'm Drew Kerhart, and uh, since I'm in my last couple of weeks of my term as president of the club, I'd not only like to uh, thank you for coming tonight uh, to view the program, there we go, um, but I'd like to thank all of you who have supported us in our online uh, venturing over the past over a year now um, and uh, helped us keep active while we've been uh, prevented from meeting in person. And along that note, I'd like to also announce that uh, as far as getting back to in-person programming, both for our monthly meetings and our fundamentals programs like tonight's, we are still uh, controlled by our hosts where we hold our meetings at the uh, Naperville Municipal Center. But we're planning that come August of this year, a couple of months from now, we will likely be back to doing in-person meetings. So that's something to look forward to. We are also planning come that time to uh, be recording those programs. And soon after they um, are held, uh, posting those programs on our YouTube channel. So, so for those of you who have uh, met us through our online programming, we're going to con continue that for people who come August, if, we, if that's when we start up our in-person meetings again, uh, aren't able to uh, do group activities yet, we will still be presenting along our programming that way come that time. So, um, for this evening, as always, uh, I will repeat our, we're, if you're viewing us live, we're welcoming you to ask questions of our speaker. If you're following us on Facebook, you simply put the question in uh, the comments column and Jim in the control room will be watching that and he'll pass them along. If you're watching via the club website or just prefer email, you can send us an email and uh, Jim's also watching that inbox and we'll pass along any suitable questions for the speaker that way. So without further ado, uh, tonight's presentation is uh, on a, a part of our stargazing hobby that many of us who live in the urban and suburban areas around here enjoy doing, which is getting out into some darker spots, more out in the country to observe either with our uh, naked eyes or our binoculars or our telescopes. And so Rick's going to go through uh, how to get the most out of an evening of dark sight stargazing. So without further ado, Rick, I'm going to turn the airwaves over to you. And uh, there we go. So, uh, okay. <laughs> Let me get us started here. Oh. Always fun. All right. Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Rick Gehring, and tonight I get to talk about some of my favorite places, which are dark sites for observing. We talk a little bit about uh, what they are, why we need them, where you can find them, and how you should behave once you get there. So uh, if you can take me out of the shot there, Jim. I'll get it started. So the first question is, what is what is a dark site anyway, and why do we need them? Well, the fact is, until fairly recently, we didn't need them. I didn't grow up in Naperville, but people who do, or who did, uh, have told me that as recently as the late 60s, which I admit is about 50 years ago now, but not that long ago in the great scheme of things, uh, they tell me that uh, you could see views like this from the edge of Naperville. And for those of you who are wondering why I put up a picture with all those clouds in it, uh, those ain't clouds, folks. That's the Milky Way, which unfortunately so many of you have probably never seen live in person. And it's a shame because it's a, it's a wonderful sight. And the only place uh, that we can see it now is at dark sites because while well, this may have been your grandparents' sky. 
there's the sky you're leaving your children. It's really not much of a legacy and certainly not very inspiring. So let's spend a couple of minutes talking about how we screwed things up so badly, and then we'll get into uh, what we can do with what we have left. To figure out where all the stars went, we have to start looking at things not from our perspective, but from the stars' perspective. And if you Google Earth at night, you'll get all kinds of images like this, satellite shots of uh, the Earth taken on clear nights. And people will say things like, oh, look, you can see the Nile River, which you can. And, oh, look, you can see the path of the Trans-Siberian Railroad, which you also can. And, oh, look, you can see Chicago, which you sure can. But I would like to suggest that when you look at pictures like this, your predominant emotion shouldn't be awe and wonder. It should really be sadness. Because bear in mind, we're looking at the light that's only seen by the stars. It's light that goes straight up in the air. It's light that literally does no earthly good. And we do it every night, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And we've been doing it for decades. And there's no sign that we're going to, going to stop. And it's not magic light. It's not light that... We grew from Jack's beanstalk seeds. It's light that comes from the same power that you're using right now to light your house, the same electricity that you're using to uh, power the screen that you're watching this on. And it's not free. It costs the same as any other power. And I don't know what it costs to generate the power needed to give us the light that we see in this picture all night long, every night, year in and year out. But if we could save half of that, we could save a tenth of that. Good Lord, just imagine what we could do. But we don't. So where does all this lost light come from? In a word, it comes mostly from thoughtless outdoor lighting fixture designs. If you pay attention to what you see uh, as, you, uh, as you look at outdoor lighting, you'll be astounded at how many Outdoor fixtures are nothing more than big round glass globes, like the one on the left that sends light up, sideways, down, whether it's needed there or not. And of course, the reason that people use those, and they use them so much, is very simple. It's because they look so nice. Unfortunately, they may look nice, but they're very bad things. Now, this isn't a presentation on uh, light pollution. So I managed to get the whole subject of light pollution down to one slide, uh, including the nice lights that are making it difficult to read what's on the slide. And by the way, that was not a mistake or an accident. Uh, so what causes light pollution? Mostly poorly designed light fixtures because light should go down not sideways, that's just glare. It's what makes the center fielder drop the ball. And it should never go up because that's just waste. It results from poorly thought out lighting plans because we can't seem to bring ourselves to put light only where it's needed, only in the amount that's needed, and only when it's needed there. Do you really think that we needed to light up this stretch of road with one, two, how many, how many fixtures? It looks like they're about every 100 feet all night long. I kind of doubt it. And it also comes from excessive blue light, particularly from LEDs. So anyone who tells you, and some people will, that light pollution isn't a problem anymore because now we have LEDs, well, they're blowing smoke. And the reason is that LEDs tend to be balanced uh, much farther than necessary towards the blue end of the spectrum. And again, for the simple reason that, oh, they look so neat. And despite the fact that blue, uh, blue light has the greatest deleterious effect on the sky, on humans, and on other species. So what are the costs? Well, it costs wasted energy, which often has its own associated pollution. It's wasted money. It costs the loss of nocturnal species habitat. 70% uh, of mammal species are nocturnal. I didn't know that until recently, but that seems to be the case. And most bird migration happens at night. Light pollution definitely has effects on our circadian rhythm, our sleeping and waking cycles. 
And although I still have a question mark after the human health effects, there's a growing number of people who would change that, ex that question mark to an exclamation point. And that leaves us with the final point, which is the one thing that I hope you'll take away from, uh, take away from this tonight, if nothing else. And that is that it doesn't cost a dime more to do it right. It's just, it's a problem that no one really gains from, and it's puzzling why it continues. But they said, we're not here to talk about light pollution. We're talking about, we're here to talk about what light pollution does to the sky and why we need dark sites. So what does it do? Well, as the sun goes down at night and the sky starts to darken, we say the stars are coming out, but that's not really true. The stars are always there. They're not coming out. It's just that as the sky becomes darker and darker, the stars become more and more visible. But it works the other way too. If your sky never really becomes dark, then your stars never really become visible. And we end up with a, a uh, range of skies like the uh, what I used to see when I walked out of the office in the loop uh, late at night look up and see a sky like you see at the far left of this series. If there was a single star in the sky, it was a big deal because you could hardly ever see any stars. And you get the urban suburban transition, which is what most of us are living in out in the suburbs. Suburban sky, which is really not something that you can find in what we think of as the suburbs anymore. You need to get out beyond, uh, uh, beyond Aurora farther away from the city than that before you'll get to skies that are classified as suburban under this system. <coughs> and then of course, there's the darker skies, the rural sky, and the, uh, the truly dark sky, the desert at night kind of skies, which are increasingly difficult to get to from anywhere near here. So why would you want to observe at a dark site? Well, when they asked Willie Sutton why he robbed banks, he said, that's where the money is. Well, you'd like to observe at a dark site because that's where the stars are. If you look at those two pictures that we started out with, with the current sky and grandparents' sky, it's not too difficult to figure out that you're going to see fainter targets and finer details in the sky on the right than you are in the sky on the left. And those are good reasons to want to observe at, at a dark site rather than your backyard. This sort of illustrates that. Uh, this is, I'm lying to you a little bit with this, these pictures because they're not taken under dark sky versus light polluted sky. They're both taken in a light polluted sky, but the one on the right uh, uses a uh, light pollution reduction filter, which gives you an idea of what it would look like under a darker sky. Uh, and the impression that it leaves is certainly certainly not a lie at all. Uh, the dumbbell nebula, which is what this what this target is, uh, a planetary nebula uh, that's out in the summer and is a pretty neat target, um, looks much better in the uh, in the dark sky because of the contrast, because of the detail that you can see, and it's not just this target, but all of the targets that we look at are going to look markedly better under a dark sky than they are under a polluted sky. While I was preparing this talk, I happened to notice on the uh, chat group of uh, a different club, uh, some folks were out at a place called Green River, which is one of the dark sites we're going to talk about later tonight. And they posted on the message board that they were out there doing some imaging. And someone posted back, said, how are the skies out there tonight? And when I saw the answer, I thought, you know, that that really is probably the best answer to the question, why observe at a dark site? Because this is coming from somebody uh, who's standing under the kind of skies that you want to observe in. And his response is, so it's better than I could, I think, uh, the answer to the question why observe at a dark site rather than elsewhere. So telescope folks are 
at heart, we're all geeks and we all have to put numbers on things because that's what geeks do among other things. So an amateur astronomer named John Bortle many years ago uh, put numbers on light pollution and developed what is now known as the Bortle scale uh, to measure light pollution starting from uh, that desert at night sky, which is Bortle one or, a, or Bortle black. They're sometimes referred to as the number, sometimes as the color. And then progressing through gray, blue, green, yellow, orange, red, and white, where you get the Chicago loop sky with no stars at all there at the left end. And the descriptions for some of them, uh, I think also help to answer the question, you know, why, why would you want to take the trouble to go to a dark site? Uh, under Bortle Gray Skies, the definitions includes the Milky Way casts faint shadows. I mean, imagine how cool that must be. Clouds are black holes in the sky. In Bortle Blue Skies, which are as good as you're going to find anywhere in Illinois or most Midwestern states today, the sky is crowded with stars. The Milky Way reaches the horizon. Stars look large and close. Bortle Green Skies, which is about as good as it gets close to where we're at here. Even there, the Milky Way shows dark lanes and the light domes, there are light domes present, but they're only seen near the horizon. Then you get starting, start to get far less interesting skies with yellow, where city glow rises up to 45 degrees. Halfway up the sky, you're looking at the glow of nearby cities and towns. Clouds are gray at the zenith rather than black holes and white at lower levels because they're reflecting that light. Bortle orange skies, the sky is not even black anymore. It's gray. Clouds are all bright white. And those stars that looked so large and close under the blue sky, blue, Bortle blue skies, now look small and far away. And then in the city sky, sky is bright, very few stars, and most people don't look up, which is kind of sad. Hey, Rick, uh, you have a question that came in. What, why are the clouds, why do the clouds look like black holes under uh, Bortle 2 or Bortle 1? Well, because there's, the, you know, clouds don't have, clouds don't have light bulbs inside them, right? So, when you look up at night and you see clouds in the sky, what you're really seeing is the light on the ground reflecting off the cloud in the sky. That's why if you're, uh, if you're near Chicago, clouds tend to look orange because of the uh, chemistry of, uh, of the Chicago street lamps. Um, elsewhere, they, they look white because of the chemistry of the sweet street lamps that they use most other places. Uh, but what you're seeing in, in clouds, cloud, um, illuminance is the reflection of light from the ground. In good dark skies, there is no light on the ground for the clouds to reflect. So instead of seeing a, a white thing in the sky that's reflecting the light, you see a black patch in the sky because it's blocking the only light that is, that's available, which is the light coming from the stars. So it's, uh, it's, it's a very, uh, very, different effect okay does that make sense yeah makes sense to me okay um so we've got the bordel scale we've got uh the run from black gray blue green yellow orange red white and we've got the united states the way the bordel scale sees it or the way the bordel scale saw it a few years ago this is also uh, several years out of date um and it has not been getting better since then, I can tell you. Uh, you can see, by the way, uh, people often ask about the very distinct line of demarcation that runs up through central Texas, through the Great Plains, and kind of smacks, runs smack into Winnipeg up there in Canada. Um, that actually is a real phenomenon. It's a meteorological uh, uh, phenomenon, I guess is the right word, called the, uh, called the continental dry line. And if you look at where it's located with respect to the Gulf of Mexico, it starts to make sense because 
as the wind comes up from the south over the Gulf of Mexico, it picks up moisture and then drops it over the uh, land to the north of that uh, as rain and crops grow. Cities are built around the uh, areas where the crops grew and off you go. All of a sudden you have a lot of, a lot of development. Uh, to the left of that line, uh, the southerly winds aren't going over the nice warm waters of the Gulf. They're going over the dry land uh, in Mexico. Uh, so there's not as much rain. There uh, were fewer cities and, uh, and much less development and, and much less light as a result. So that's, that's why you see that, uh, that very distinct line in the middle. But if you look around Chicago, we don't have uh, uh, any distinct lines at all. All we have is the whole lot of white, red, and a little bit of orange on the fringes. Here I uh, faded the colors a little bit so the names of the cities would come through, uh, but I wanted to use this slide to, uh, to show you just how far you have to go in order to get to Bortle Blue Skies from around here. Um, there's a little spot there uh, in central Illinois uh, down uh, between Qu Quincy and Peoria down here. And actually there's a uh, state park down there that we're gonna talk about uh, in a little bit uh, where you can go to observe. The blue areas to the left of that are all in uh, Missouri and Iowa. A lot of that is swampland and not really accessible for observing. There's some bordel blue west of Madison up here in, uh, in Wisconsin. Uh, those areas are fairly heavily forested and it's very difficult to do any uh, any observing there so uh, you have to go a long long way before you can get to a place from here where you can observe under um, under bordel blue skies and this is how it looks in our neck of the woods uh, so if you Look at the towns that we see along the left edge of that uh, white area. If, if you live in Elgin, Carroll Stream, Wheaton, Naperville, Aurora, Bolingbrook, or any place east of there, uh, you are under really the pretty much the worst skies in the world for trying to see anything in the, in the, uh, in the heavens. And you need to... Uh, need to head out in order to find better skies. But at the end of the day, you know, a dark site is any place that's darker than what you're used to. So it doesn't have to be bordel blue, doesn't have to be bordel gray. Um, sometimes it doesn't have to be anything other than your backyard. Which brings us to second question, where can I find a dark site? Well, if you're creative, you can make your own in your backyard. Uh, you can at least make the make the site, uh, whether it's your backyard or any place else that you're observing, uh, you can at least try to minimize the harm that the light pollution is causing. Uh, if there are shadowed areas, uh, you can set up there to minimize the effects of a bright moon if you're observing on a, uh, uh, on a night when the moon's up. You can use buildings or other obstructions to block nearby lighting. There's a school in Western Springs where we have done uh, uh, stargazing events for uh, for a middle school there uh, for many many years. In the first year we were there, the field we were using uh, is right at the end of a of a street where the, they get quite a bit of traffic. And anytime a car would come down the street, of course, the headlights would would come lighting up our field and making it impossible to see anything until the car went away until uh, one of the guys that was out there said, hey, I got some tarps in my truck. And there was a fence, chain link fence around the edge of the field. So he took the tarps, fussed them over the, over the fence to uh, block the headlights. And from there on in, we had actually a pretty, uh, a pretty nice field to, to uh, observe from. And we've been going back there probably for 10 years now and uh, covering up that fence every time and doing a pretty good job of uh, making our own little dark site for, uh, for the kids and the uh, parents from the middle school. If you're at home and you have neighbors who uh, think that their 
uh, think that their outside lights are, you know, the only thing standing between them and uh, and perdition, uh, you might be able to get them to turn them off for a little while if uh, if you get along with them well. Uh, if you can get and stay dark adapted, uh, it can help. Uh, dark adaptation we'll talk about a little bit more later, but it essentially is where your pupils uh, open up, uh, which happens in the dark because it's, it's what your eyes do to, uh, uh, to enable you to see when it's, uh, when it's darker. Uh, but as soon as they're exposed to white light, those pupils snap back down and it takes you know, anywhere from a half hour to an hour to get dark adapted again. So if you uh, can avoid white lights while you're observing, wherever you're observing, uh, that's a good thing. And if all else fails, you can steal a trick from my grandfather and the other old time photographers and put a dark cloth over your head while you're at the eyepiece. Uh, that dark cloth will keep light from around you away and uh, give your eyes an opportunity to uh, get dark adapted under there. And it will make a, I think you'll find that it'll make a, a significant difference in the amount of detail that you're able to see, even, even if you're observing under fairly mediocre skies, uh, having your pupils opened up will, uh, will help. And of course it works the other way too. I mean, you can try to make a bad site better, uh, but you can also uh, make a good site bad if uh, there's even if there's only one street light in sight and you're in a in a bordel blue area if the only place you can set up is right under the street light you're not going to have a good night so the um, the quality of the uh, site is going to depend on a lot of things starting with its location so where are some dark sites near here. Well, if you're a member of NAA, you probably already know that we have a couple of uh, uh, private sites where we have um, agreements, arrangements with uh, uh, some uh, farmers to use parts of their land to, uh, uh, to do our observing. And uh, part of the agreement we have with them is that uh, we won't go around telling people where the sites are. So I uh, can't tell you on this on this program, but if you remember, you have a member's packet and uh, there are directions with odometer counts in your member's folder. And I can tell you because the first time I went to uh, each of our um, private sites, I used those odometer counts to get there and got there without uh, without any problem at all. So you can rely on those. They are absolutely dead on accurate. And thank you to the people many years ago who, uh, who put them together for us. Alternatively, if you're an NAA member and you are concerned about uh, uh, finding your way to, the, to one of the NAA dark sites or uh, otherwise concerned about getting there, uh, you can post on the IO group and see if anyone else is heading out that way and ask if you can meet up with them uh, someplace along the way and follow them in. We're actually doing a, uh, a group caravan meetup for one of the uh, one of the dark sites in June. So those of you who have not been to a uh, NAA dark site before, uh, that would be a excellent time to uh, to dip your dip your toes in that pool although i can't tell you where they are i can at least talk a little bit about the sites themselves and what to expect when you get there uh, this is the cf site it's bortle yellow so it's you know, certainly better than your backyard and uh, not uh, not nearly as good as uh, the middle of the desert. It's only about 45 minutes away from Naperville, so it's convenient in that respect. When you come in, you'll come in along this long road that we see coming out of the bottom of the picture. Uh, if you're going to leave early, and we're going to talk about leaving early as, uh, as an etiquette issue a little later on, but if you're going to leave early, this spot right here, uh, near the corner of uh, this first building is an excellent place to park. You can park there, you can back in there with your um, 
with your headlights facing out so you can pull straight out onto the road when you leave. It's away from the observing areas, so you won't be uh, lighting up anybody's uh, anybody's observing field with your headlights. So that's a great place to park if you're going to be leaving early. People tend to set up in this area. Um, I'm assuming you can see my uh, my cursor. If you can't, Jim, would you let me know? Because yeah, we, can, we can see it. You can see it. Okay. All right. Um, in this area here, people tend to set up uh, for the west horizon. Uh, you get a nice flat west horizon from, from there. Most people, however, set up in this area back behind the barn, and uh, they'll park in this right at the edge of the gravel here, and uh, then come over and set up in, in this part of the field. Gets you a little bit farther away from uh, uh, from from stuff. It gives you these buildings to use uh, uh, for uh, shadow if uh, if the moon's out and it's uh, not a not a bad little spot to uh, to observe that's pretty close to uh, pretty close to home a little farther away although not that much farther away is the rr site it's only about an hour from uh, from naperville it's uh, it's a little better sky it's yellow green it's about mortal four and a half um so it's uh it's definitely darker than uh the CF site. And again, um, get in, you pull in, there's a little gravel area in here that uh, uh, you'll, you'll know when to, when to get there because you'll see this uh, green storage building here. Um, at both RR and CF, you know, you got to bear in mind that these are both working farms. So let me go back to CF for a moment. Um, you, know, you can see some of the equipment that they've got out here. They've got this nice long beam here. They've got, uh, there's always tractors parked around and there's uh, things that are being towed by tractors and all sorts of stuff that uh, uh, you would not want to trip and fall onto. Uh, so you have the same situation again at, uh, at RR, we have equipment back here and around the back of the barn, uh, which is a good reason to get there, especially your first couple of times, uh, to get there while it's still light out because the equipment uh, is uh, potentially dangerous and not necessarily in the same place it was the last time you were there. So uh, knowing where it is is important. So at RR, there's a couple of places to set up. Uh, you can set up in the front here, in front of the barn. Um, to the west of the barn, uh, some people set up along the along this uh, strip here. Although uh, this the, the lane that they leave for us to get out can be uh, kind of narrow. So if it's uh, if it's not if it hasn't been well mown, it's probably not a good idea to set up in in that strip. Uh, most people who are coming in for the whole evening will set up in the back of the barn in this area right along here. Um, and there's room there to, uh, to park the car and to set up next to your car without uh, getting in other people's way. And let me show you the... Uh... Hey, Rick, uh, we have a question that came in. Sure. Um, do you know, is camping overnight allowed at the dark sites? Um, I know, I know at least one person that's done it, but I don't know that if well, we ever talked to the, I, I certainly know it. more than one person who has uh, gone out there, observed until they couldn't stand up anymore and slept for an hour or so in their car before they went home. Um, I, I'm not sure if that's what you mean by camping. I've never, <coughs> I've never seen anybody pitch a tent. Um, I I don't think there's anything. The question has never come up before. Um, you know, these are these are places that are you know, for most of us, uh, you know, unless unless you live really far away, um, an hour's drive isn't that big a deal. Um, Actually, if, if I could interrupt, I would say that in both of the arrangements that we have with the property owners, uh, camping, in, in other words, putting up a tent or bringing in a trailer and 
uh, residing there overnight was not part of what we arranged with them. Um, again, like Rick says, obviously you could be there from dusk till dawn standing by your telescope or, or sleeping in your car for an hour before you head home. But those would be, it would be crossing the line to have any sort of uh, tent or RV or something to be, you know, staking a claim and using it as a campground. So uh, yeah. I think that and, would, and, and, would be over the line. And in a way, more more pragmatically, um, seems pretty unnecessary uh, I, as well. I think the probably the main people that might do it is somebody that would want to image um, on a Friday and a Saturday night and not want to move the move their telescope. Then I would definitely uh, say we, we do not have the arrangement to like stay right. there for the weekend. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah. I don't know if. Yeah, because these are, don't forget, these are working farms. Um, and also, we uh, camping would imply and staying overnight would be implied that you're using the property as a bathroom too, which is not, yeah. <laughs> is yeah. not actually uh, something right. that we have a yeah. positive agreement upon. So. Yeah. Yeah. And not only that, but I would definitely not leave any equipment, uh, any telescopic equipment out there uh, and expect to find it still standing. Um, a, it is a working farm. Uh, the, uh, the, these guys uh, are, if, if your telescope's in their way, they got a job to do and they're going to do it. Um, and also, uh, there are animals out there as well. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't leave uh, my scope out there all day unattended, uh, even if it, even without the uh, working farm aspect. So, so, I, so I think that probably covers everything on that subject. But there are other star parties too that specifically camping is a, is a part of it. Yeah, we'll get there. Um, we'll get to those in a moment. Yeah. All right. So anyway, um our, our this is the this is the lane that leads back behind the barn. Um as you can see you wouldn't want to, uh, the way they've got it mown here, you probably would not want to set up in this stretch because people uh, may be trying to get out from behind the barn. Um, and you really don't want them to have to run over you and your telescope in order to do that. So let's talk about some public sites uh, rather than the NAA, NAA private sites. Uh, this is one that used to be an NAA site, although it was, you know, still public at uh, Silver Springs uh, Fish and Wildlife Area down uh, uh, down near uh, near Yorkville. It's about 23 miles from Naperville. Uh, again, about a 45 minute drive, uh, and uh, not very good skies, which is why we don't have it as one of our preferred dark sites anymore. But it is close, and it's probably better than your backyard. Uh, so in a pinch, it's it's not a bad place to go. It has uh, Bortle 6 orange skies. And there are several uh, parking lots where uh, you can observe. The one over here at the uh, at the so-called primitive campground was, uh, uh, was used, I know, from uh, part of the time. Uh, the one up here at the northeast corner of the main property uh, is one where people uh, people observed. I don't know if people observed in the big lot down here or not, but it looks like you uh, it looks like you could. So that's uh, that's a place you might want to consider going. Another public site, one that we just recently added to the NAA list, is the uh, uh, Afton Forest Preserve, which is due south of DeKalb. It's about 38 miles from uh, from Naperville. You can get there in less than an hour, and it's uh, it's not a bad spot. Um, most of the observing is done here in the big lot. Uh, you come come in, swing around, and, uh, and you can park in there and set up. Some people observe up here in the uh, at the north end, um, and actually some people observe at the north end specifically because of this building, which is something you don't find at. Uh, most uh, most of our dark sites, and that's a bathroom. So some people like to uh, have that available, and they'll uh, uh, observe in the north lot for uh, for that reason. A 
a little farther away, uh, but markedly better skies can be found at a place called Green River State Wildlife Area, which is due south of Dixon. It's, uh, it's a pretty decent haul. It's uh, nearly 100 miles from, uh, uh, from Naperville. It takes about an hour and a half to get there. But once you're there, it's, uh, it's a pretty decent spot. The major observing areas are fairly close to, uh, we go back here, fairly close to the road uh, that, you, that you come in on. Oh, excuse me, there we go. And uh, there's a couple of parking lots. There's a paved parking lot over here next to the uh, Hunter's check-in station and a uh, gravel lot on the west side of the road. Uh, there are uh, latrine toilets uh, available here. Uh, and it's also a place where uh, the bootleg star party is held there. Um, let me flip over here. Okay, and this is just what it looks like in the uh, in the gravel lot. So you've got a you've got a nice south horizon, uh, a couple of trees there, but they don't really get in the way of much, and uh, plenty of room to. Uh, Plenty of room to set up and and spread out. There's a place that uh, got talked about, but not really gone too much, called Middle Fork River, which is uh, uh, south of uh, south of us, uh, about a two-hour drive. Uh, it was talked about mostly because it was recently, a couple of years ago, designated as a dark sky park by the uh, International Dark Sky Association. And uh, I know we've had a couple people who have observed from the campsites at Middle Fork River. Uh, it's it's better skies than, uh, at least nominally better skies than, than Green River, which makes it a pretty good place uh, in that respect. Uh, but it's a little unclear from their website whether they really want you observing from the campsites. Uh, there is a space, if you look here at the top, this Route 9 uh, that goes uh, across north of the uh, uh, north of the main area. If you go about another mile to the uh, to the west, you come on this little turnoff with a parking lot that's actually it's bigger than it looks here. That's a car parked in the parking lot, which will give you a sense of uh, uh, the size of the uh, the size of the area. Uh, their website designates this as the overnight stargazing spot. Uh, which, you know, they unfortunately decided to put it right next to a huge wetlands area, which has got to make it uh, uh, far from ideal in the uh, on a hot summer night. Um, and I would hate to uh, find out what the bug situation is up there uh, between, uh, between sunset and the end of twilight. But it's a place that... Uh, uh, if you wanted to spend a couple hours getting there, you might want to talk with them uh, on the phone about uh, about observing from the campsite area, which is, uh, as I say, much uh, much more uh, pleasant-looking spot for this site. The best skies in Illinois are probably or the best accessible skies in Illinois are the Bortle Blue skies, which are you can get to in Weinberg King State Park. It's going to take you a four-hour drive each way to get there. Now, I know that uh, Andy Salata, I believe, from uh, from NAA has observed there a couple of times. And uh, uh, if you're planning on, if you are considering going there, it'd be a good idea to talk to, uh, talk to Andy about specifics. Um, I have not gotten down there myself, so I can't really speak from experience. Uh, but from looking at the... Uh, Looking at the uh, satellite image of the park, there's certainly uh, uh, all kinds of spots where uh, you can set up a uh, set up a telescope and uh, and observe. And as I said, you know, it's the 
closest portal blue skies you're going to find. So it may be worth that drive. More Bortle blue skies, but uh, and again, it's uh, even even farther away. This one's about a five hour drive in each direction, uh, all the way up at the end of Door County in Wisconsin, uh, very recently designated IDSA Dark Sky Park, but excuse me, Dark Sky Park at uh, Newport State Park. The observing area there and it's really the only place uh, that observing is is uh, doable there because of the uh, the amount of tree cover uh, but there's a place called parking lot number three uh, you can park there and there's areas here uh, just off the parking lot and a little farther down uh, close to closer to the uh, to the water some flat areas where uh, where you can set up and uh, and do some nice observing under uh, bordel blue skies there. For really, really dark skies, you have to make a really, really long trip. Uh, I think the closest, um, at least well-known, uh, bordel gray area is in Nebraska, is south of the town of Valentine, a place called Merritt Reservoir. It's where they hold the Nebraska Star Party every year. It's about a 12-hour drive uh, in each direction. And uh, people who have made that drive uh, have said it was uh, uh, the best 12 hours they uh, best 12 hours they ever spent. Um, I don't know anyone who's been here who does not rave about it. I think anytime you have a uh, a place that has a spot called Dab Row, uh, you can probably figure that uh, you're under pretty decent skies, and uh, the skies there certainly uh, are certainly are that. And uh, when everybody gets there for the uh, um, Nebraska Star Party uh, it can get a little more crowded than what you see here. Uh, although this is where the Nebraska Star Party is held, this is a um, Nebraska State public access area, um, and it's open all year round. So uh, it's you know the the sky is not dark there only during the Nebraska Star Party. It's uh, it's dark all the time, so it's a place that you can. Uh, uh, certainly consider going um, other than during the star party itself, although, you know, obviously you, you miss being able to stand in line over there by the, uh, by the tent where they're serving dinner and that sort of thing. So those are a number of, a number of sites uh, more or less accessible from here. Uh, some are easy to get to, some of them are harder to get to, but the ones that are harder to get to, you, there's a bigger payoff. So once you get there, how should you act? Well, there's just a couple of really hard and fast rules and then a whole lot of etiquette. So let's see what we can find out about that. Anytime you're going to a, a public site, um, you know, you have to bear in mind that it's public and you're going to have to put up with other people who are there. <coughs> you know, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the sites that we talked about were uh, uh, state wildlife areas. And, you know, when they call it a state wildlife area, it's not a zoo, it's, it's a hunting area. So you are going to be in many, uh, you know, many uh, parts of the year. Uh, you're going to be, if you're up there, you're going to be sharing your uh, uh, the site with uh, bow hunters, rifle hunters, um, and you probably want to know what's going on, uh, particularly during hunting season. So uh, all of these places have uh, have websites. They all have phone numbers. And uh, they're all happy to uh, have you call up and uh, say that you're planning to uh, planning to come visit and do some uh, do some stargazing or however you want to describe it, uh, and ask them you know if there's anything that you need to be aware of, any permits that you need. Uh, some of the places uh, uh, 
surprisingly enough, do require an access permit for everybody who comes on the site. Uh, I, I doubt that they would shoot you if you don't have one, but uh, they might fine you for it, and there's no point getting yourself exposed to that. And at it, it worst, they, or at least they might tell you to leave, which if you're having a good night of observing, you don't want that to happen either. So I definitely suggest that uh, you you call the operator, uh, talk to the rangers uh, before you go, uh, ask them. I always ask, you know, is there, are there particular places there that, uh, you know, the guys with telescopes tend to go to uh, because if somebody is, uh, has already scoped the place out and figured out the good uh, observing spots, you might as well take advantage of that. And the rangers are, you know, generally happy to, uh, to share what they know, although, uh, they don't tend to be uh, tend to be telescope guys themselves. There are some exceptions, but uh, as I say, always uh, always a good idea to call them ahead. Uh, the procedures for uh, Afton are covered in the NAA members handbook. Uh, at Afton and at many of these other sites, uh, you know, they technically Afton closes uh, either at sunset or an hour after sunset, and to be there legally, you need to go through their procedures. Uh, they they do have procedures specifically for uh, uh, for uh, stargazing uh, stargazing uh, uses, and it's not a big deal. But uh, you know you should comply with them. Once you decide you're going to go someplace, it's it's a nice thing, it's an etiquette thing, to let other NAA members know what you're going to be doing. Um, there may be people who would consider going out to observe at RR or CF or, or wherever, uh, but they don't want to make the drive and, uh, and be out there observing by themselves for whatever reason. So if you do post on the message board that you're going to, uh, that you're going to be at RR or or you're going to uh, Green River or whatever you post, don't post it if you don't mean it, uh, because other people might be relying on you to be there, and uh, you don't want to you certainly don't want to get a reputation as being uh, uh, one of these people who keeps saying they're going to be someplace, and then when the time comes, uh, you get out there and uh, you're out there all by yourself because uh, the other uh, person who posted uh, didn't bother to show up. So how do you plan one of these trips? Well, you know, planning uh, planning any observing session is a, is a whole evening's presentation in itself, but uh, there's a few things that are specific to dark sites. For NAA private sites, part of our deal with the farmers is that, uh, you know, it's, it's for the members. So it's members only plus one guest at the NAA private sites. At the public sites, it's however many people uh, you can talk into uh, into coming along with you. A lot of people think that they can't go to the dark site if they aren't bringing a telescope. Well, that's completely completely wrong. Um, but if you do bring a telescope, you know, we're going to talk in a minute about uh, um, you know sharing the view if you don't have a telescope. But but if you do bring one, when you're planning your trip, I strongly 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 urge you to make a list of the things you are going to need when you get there and use it. Uh, we had a member a number of years ago who bought a magnificent six inch astrophysics refractor and a ridiculously expensive astrophysics mount to put it on and brought it out to RR one night and didn't bring any counterweights. And unfortunately, uh, because of the size uh, counterweight shaft they use on astrophysics uh, mounts. None of us had a counter had any counterweights that would work on his mount. So that that beautiful uh, astrophysics scope sat in its uh, sat in its box all night uh, because he just didn't make a list uh, or didn't use it or just plain forgot that oh yeah got to have some got to have counterweights to mount the scope. So make a list. Use it. 
and try not to find yourself out there wishing that you had uh, packed whatever it is that you don't have. Dress for temperatures 20 degrees cooler than expected. This is usually something people say for uh, wintertime observing, but it's true in the summer too, uh, particularly on nights when uh, there's a little bit of moisture in the air, it gets a little bit humid, and that cold, wet, or that uh, damp air starts to starts to get colder overnight. Uh, it can get awfully cold in uh, in July and August. So by all means, uh, bring something warm. Bring a sweatshirt, no matter what uh, time of year it is. Uh, the worst that happens is you won't use it, and uh, the best that happens is it keeps you from having a really miserable night. Bugs usually go away after the sun goes down eventually, but until then, uh, they can be a real bear. So bring bug spray, but please don't spray that stuff near anyone's scope because you really don't want to uh, get those aerosols on expensive optics. Similarly, bring a chair because you're gonna wanna sit down bring some water because you're going to want to stay hydrated and maybe bring something to eat or to snack on. But again, uh, don't eat or drink near the scopes because you really don't want to end up uh, spilling things where, uh, where you wish you hadn't. Uh, Rick, the, the mosquitoes in Nebraska didn't get that memo about going away after, uh, after the sun sets just well that's uh, I, I from what i understand the mosquitoes in nebraska can uh, uh, can pick up your car and move it for you if you don't like where you parked it too i'm pretty so. sure that's their state bird is the mosquito yeah yeah so well you know like i said that's uh, that's the price you got to pay for those bordel two skies there's 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 a rule that uh, we have at dark sites and uh if if I had bigger type than this, I would have used bigger type than this. Uh, and if I could actually get away with screaming this at you, I would scream this at you because the most important rule for dark sites is no white light. You know, like we talked about very briefly earlier, uh, when you're at a dark site or when you're doing any observing, the object of the exercise is to get your pupils as big as they will get. The older we get, the smaller that is, just because eyes get old along with the rest of us. But you want to get your pupils as wide as you can to take in as much light as possible uh, so you can see the faintest uh, details uh, that, that you can see. And it takes only an instant of exposure to white light to ruin all of that and set you back at least a half hour, uh, maybe an hour. Uh, again, it's something that takes longer and longer the older you get uh, to become dark adapted again. So if you wanna get people at a dark site really, really mad at you, start flashing white lights. Um, it's, it's the one the one inviolable, inviolable rule, and it's the one unforgivable sin. So please just don't do it. If you come driving into the dark site late at night with your car looking like this, um, I, 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 I think you are going to hear about it, <laughs> to put it mildly. So what do you do? Um, because, you know, cars look like this at night. Well, if you're like me and you drive a Volvo, which I think is the only automaker that still treats its owners like adults and puts a switch in that will let you actually turn your lights off, uh, then it's easy. You just turn the lights off. I, I think Volvo is probably the only manufacturer that does that, now at least the only one that I'm aware of. Um, back when cars had mechanical parking brakes, uh, engaging the brake would always override the uh, automatic headlights so you could pull up one notch of brake, uh, which really didn't cause any problem as long as you were driving slow and not very far. Almost no cars have mechanical brakes anymore, so mechanical parking brakes anymore, so that doesn't work. 
If you're a gearhead and you're familiar with what's in your uh, in your car's fuse box, and you are comfortable pulling the uh, headlight fuse and putting it back in before you leave, uh, more power to you. But most people uh, don't fall in that category. So we are stuck then with people driving in and out of dark sites with their headlights on because they just don't have a choice. So how do we deal with that? Well, we talk about arriving and departing. Um, we'll talk about how you do that to minimize the harm. But before we go away from your car altogether, uh, I want to talk about uh, the other aspect of car lights, which is all the interior lights and other things that come on every time you open the doors or open the trunk or open the hatch. Uh, if you're going to be repeatedly opening your car at a dark site, you need to uh, cover all of those lights with something red so, uh, so you're not throwing white light around. Um, Tail light tape you used to be able to buy at Walmart for a buck a roll. I'm not sure if it maybe is a little more these days, but uh, uh, whenever we go back to having live meetings, um, I've always got some tail light tape in the car. And if you catch me at a meeting, I will not only give you the tail light tape to uh, uh, tape up the interior lights on your cars, I'll even tape it up for you. Uh, just to make sure it's it's done. Um, if you have red gaffers tape, that's even better. Uh, but there are so many lights that come on when you uh, when you open the uh, open the doors or trunk, uh, including these silly things underneath the bottoms of the doors that people used to miss for a while. Uh, that uh, they they really need to be muted if you're going to be opening and closing your doors frequently at a dark site. If you're just coming up uh, without a telescope to uh, uh, to share the view with others, hopefully you will not have to open your car door at all from the time you get there until the time you leave. But if you're like me and you have all kinds of stuff inside the car that you're constantly getting in and out uh, to, uh, to get, uh, you need to have those lights uh, taken out of the picture. So when you get there and how you get there uh, is important. Get there while it's still light. And that is true whether you are coming to a dark site for the first time or whether you know, you've uh, been to dark sites hundreds of times. Uh, it's always best to get there while it's still light or at least twilight. Uh, so you won't need headlights when you're coming in. Uh, you won't run, you'll be able to see where you're going. You won't run into a ditch uh, when you're turning off the country road and into the uh, and into the site. Uh, you can see what's where before you decide where to park and where to walk, particularly on the uh, on the farm sites where uh, things may not be where they were the last time you were there and uh, and when some of them are uh, are sharp and you really don't want to fall into them. And also, it's a lot easier to set up your scope without breaking, uh, uh, without breaking things, if you're doing it while it's uh, while it's still light enough to see. So there's there's abundant reasons for getting to the site while it's still uh, while there's still enough light to see by. When you get there, think about how you're going to get out, uh, especially if you're going to leave before uh, uh, you know, before dawn and most people do. So park in a way that you can pull out without backing up because the last thing you want to do is have the uh, white light coming from your headlights in front that you can't turn off and the backup lights in the back uh, that uh, where you're backing up. Point your car away from any area where scopes are set up. So when you do turn it on to leave and those headlights come on, you're not flooding somebody's field and uh, or somebody's observing field with light. And when you get there, there's nothing wrong with asking someone who was already there where would be a good place to park, especially if you're planning to leave early. Um, they'll be, you know, more than happy to uh, to help you find a place where you can. Uh, 
uh, get in and out without uh, without disrupting uh, without disrupting people's observing. After you get there, like I said earlier, get everything. Please get everything out when you arrive instead of repeatedly opening and closing the doors. There are uh, a couple of a couple of members in the club who uh, have uh, been complaining for years about uh, one night they spent at Green River with uh, a group of people who were uh, astronomers from a different club who uh, constantly were getting things out of their trunk with uh, with unshielded white lights in the trunk. Um, you don't want to do that. So if you uh, if you do not have uh, have red tape on your interior lights, <coughs> excuse me, get everything out uh, right when you get there so you don't have to uh, be a nuisance. Uh, in the uh, in the members packet, you will see these rules as well. No alcohol, no loud music or other noise, no fires. Um, I don't know if we've got a, a specific rule against firearms, but I think that's uh, also implied. At the NAA sites, stay out of buildings and fields. Um, you know, these are uh, uh, the the things in the buildings are again um, largely dangerous stuff. If particularly if you don't know what you're doing around them. Um, where the fields are uh, these people's crops. This is their livelihood. Uh, don't go tramping around out there. The the CF site, we have a wording around going inside a building to turn off a light that the that the farmer has. Right. Yeah, but that's the only reason you need to go in a building there. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And don't forget. Uh, on the NAA sites and on these other sites, wherever you're at, it's rural. Expect dirt. Expect farm equipment on the farms. And don't expect toilets. Like my father used to say, you should have taken care of that before we left. Uh, well, take care of that before you leave. Uh, you're not going to find a toilet uh, at most of these, uh, most of these sites. Um, some do, but most don't. And, you know, charge your phone before you go. Um, keep that bright screen covered, though. We're going to talk about that again in a minute. And uh, if your phone uh, needs to be charged, don't go out there expecting someone else to have the cable that you need. If you uh, think you're going to need to charge your phone, you know, as you go along, bring it, uh, bring the cable along with you. So how do you share the view, particularly if you didn't bring a scope? It's, it's really easy um, with very few exceptions that we're going to talk about up here in a minute. If someone is standing at their telescope, walk up to them and ask them what they got. And they will be thrilled to show you what, uh, what's, in the, uh, what's in the telescope. Uh, there's only one time that, uh, that amateur astronomers are not going to be willing to share the view with you. And that's during totality, during a total solar eclipse. Uh, so if it's not during totality, uh, assume that anyone who is looking into a telescope would be more than happy to uh, let you look to and to tell you what you're looking at and answer any questions that you have. Um, None of us bite, uh, at least as far as I know, and uh, uh, be more than happy to uh, to show you what's in there. On the other hand, if someone's looking at a computer screen, they're probably doing astrophotography, and there's nothing they can show you, at least not yet. So um, they probably uh, are not even looking through the uh, through the eyepiece. They've got a camera stuck in there anyway. So there's probably no sense in uh, asking for someone to share the view when they're looking at a computer screen. But if they're looking through an eyepiece, uh, feel free. Don't touch anything without asking. Um, in fact, I, I have a hard time 
thinking of circumstances where you would even want to touch uh, after you ask, but uh, at least uh, at least ask before you touch. Uh, these things are expensive, and you know even the cheap ones can be broken. So. Final point uh, in, ter in terms of uh, sharing the view is green lasers. Um, you know, they're wonderful things. They're great for pointing, uh, pointing to things in the sky, but they ruin astrophotos and um, should be used minimally, um, if at all, at dark sites. <clears throat> Flash photography, I only mentioned because there was a time um, many years ago when a member of the club, of all things, was at RR taking flash pictures. And it just sort of boggles the mind that uh, uh, they, they didn't realize how absolutely wrong that was. But uh, please don't take flash pictures at a dark site unless you really want people to be mad at you. Because, if I didn't mention it earlier, there's a rule. It goes no white light. Um, even bright uh, red lights can sometimes cause problems, and uh, uh, laptops and, and cell phones should have red filters on their screens. <clears throat> Getting towards the end here, how do you leave? Bear in mind that the back end of your car lights up like a Christmas tree uh, when you first uh, when you first start up. Uh, most cars, in order to start, you've got to depress the brake pedal, which means that not only is are your tail lights coming on, but the much brighter um, brake lights are coming on, uh, and that's what's going to be pointed towards the observing field because you're pointing your headlights away from the field. So even the even the back end of your car uh, causes lots of problems for people who are, who are observing. So before you start the car, give people a shout out that uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to be starting the car in a minute. And if someone asks you to wait, wait, uh, they, they may need to you know, because the, those of us who are staying, we're going to be um, closing and covering our eyes. Anyone who's uh, doing astrophotography may have other things they need to do uh, if there's going to be uh, light on the field. And give them a second, you know, give people a second to uh, respond. When you do start your car, don't sit there with the brake on because that's just uh, extending the uh, the bright red brake light. Uh, as soon as the engine starts, you know, get get your foot off the brake so at least that light goes away. Um, and once you've started, pull out and go. Uh, don't be, you know, start the car and then decide you're going to call home and see if you need to pick up a loaf of bread on the way. Um, and sit there with those uh, with those lights making everybody miserable while you do it. And for God's sake, don't use your turn signals because that's even brighter than the red lights that we see on the uh, on the uh, uh, tail lights and and brake lights. Um, and and trust me, no no one's going to ticket you for turning left out of RR without using a signal. So uh, basically, common sense just. Uh, uh, point away from the field as much as you can and minimize the uh, minimize the harm and get it over with. So for everything else, you can pretty much just follow the traveler's golden rule, take nothing but photos, leave nothing but footprints. And if you're not an astrophotographer, well, take nothing but photons and leave nothing but footprints. And with that, I think I've pretty much told you everything I know. So if there's any, uh, any other questions, happy to hear them. Uh, I think we've answered all the questions. Um, I'll, I'll comment that I, I've sometimes seen the astrophotography people purposely set up a little bit further away from the rest of the people because they know that they're going to be 
having a few more white lights or cameras or whatever. Um, and then that puts them a little further from the green lasers too. But I think that's it, Rick. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, thanks everybody. And, uh, enjoy. We'll see y'all next time. <laughs>